so um, I'm not sure this works. I'll just do a qualify. Um, I'm probably going to start my remarks with two disclaimers, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, the first one is that although this is a policy event, I'm not a policy maker. And so what you'll be hearing from me will have more to do with how science may inform policy rather than policy itself. And the second disclaimer uh, is the fact that I'm pretty new to Manitoba. I've been living here for a little less than three years. And so what that means is I'm still looking at my surroundings to my newcomers' classes. And when I do that, and I actually compare my new surroundings to uh, other regions of the world, I can actually come up with a pretty long list of scientific reasons why uh, managing water-related disasters is not easy, not only in the Paris in general, but in Manitoba in particular. So what I'm going to do is just um, touch on a few of those. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and touch on those, a few of those reasons, uh, just so that we can start discussion later. Um, I guess the first reason is very obvious to me because there are going to be newcomers, it might not be as obvious to those of you who are born and bred in Manitoba, and that's basically the fact that the landscapes we have here are very, very different from others we have around the world. And so we need to consider a few aspects. Uh, the fact that the water we have in this province actually come coming from multiple different provinces and states as well, and we have a lot of rivers which are flowing north, and that is very unusual. There is also the fact that we actually need to deal with uh, extreme water-related events, so floods, but also droughts, which is unusual. Uh, the fact that there are very diverse landscapes in this province, so we have the flat agricultural plains in the Red River Valley, we have the prairie purple wetlands in the in the west. Uh, the boreal shell forest in the east, and because those landscapes are different, they likely require not only different prediction models, but different mitigation strategies as well. And when it comes to very simple questions, such as how water moves in the landscape and how fast it moves, uh, our scientific theories are pretty much still in their infancy. And so while this is very exciting for a researcher like me, because all those questions or knowledge gaps are the mysteries that I need to resolve, this is a little nightmare for you and your staff because you basically need to manage land and water uh, to the best of your ability, despite the fact that we lack a concrete scientific knowledge. So, I guess my second remark is a logical continuation of that first one, and it has to do with the fact that the most commercial prediction models will fail to provide accurate predictions when they're applied to the prairies. And this is not because those models are not well designed, that's because they were designed with specific landscapes in mind, and those landscapes do not share the same characteristics as prairie landscapes. So most commercial models will fail when it comes to uh, predicting uh, snow redistribution or uh, how snow melts and when it melts. Those commercial models will also fail when it comes to predicting how water will infiltrate into frozen ground or uh, how water will be stored in lake depression, wetland depressions ice related flooding, uh, prior moisture conditions, etc. So all those elements that are really critical and specific to prairie landscapes. And so there's something that's very important to remember, and that's the fact that prediction models are not magic crystal balls, if I can say it like that. There are only two situations in which they can actually provide us with the answers that we need. It's either the equations within the model are representative of what we have in the landscape, but for most commercial models it's not the case or the model is actually trained to recognize certain situations based on what's ha what happened in the past. Uh, the caveat with that is that if we have an unusual event, then the model will not be able to predict it accurately because it has not been trained to actually recognize it. Um, the third remark or third point I could make is the fact that the prairies in general, so many in particular, can be subject to many different types of floods as well. And so because the different types of floods are generated by different mechanisms They likely require different models and different mitigation strategies there again. So the snowmelt triggered floods are the ones that Manitobans are the most used to and probably the ones that Manitobans are the best equipped to predict and manage as well given years and years of experience. In recent years though, there are two other types of floods that have had catastrophic consequences here. So rain on snow floods and rainfall triggered floods like we saw this past summer. So when it comes to rain on snow, uh, the onset of the flood is very difficult to predict because we need to know what's happening inside the snow. So the severity of the flood will not only depend on the amount of rainfall that we're getting, but it will also depend on whether we have uh, clean snow versus dirty snow, or dry snow versus wet snow, 
uh, uniform depth of snow or variable depth of snow, and those pieces of information are not documented routinely across the province, which of course makes flood prediction very difficult. And when it comes to rainfall treatment flood, uh, beyond the amount of rainfall that we're getting, the type of rain event that we have is important as well. So the most typical rainfall events in the prairies are something that we call uh, convective storms. So thunderstorms, for example, a very short duration. And those are the storms that our models are basically trained to recognize and uh, respond to. What we had in June and July 2014, though, was a frontal system. So it was rainfall spread over multiple days rather than just a few hours. And I was following a long and cold winter and a very wet spring as well. And so, of course, our models are struggling a little bit when it comes to predicting those unusual events. Um, since the minister mentioned that a little bit earlier, I'm going to make a quick point about climate change. Uh, simply because after catastrophic events like the ones we saw this past summer, uh, we often hear that climate change is responsible for those catastrophic events. And I do not disagree with that, but I think that we should broaden the discussion a little bit and rather talk about environmental change. Because when we talk about environmental change, we're actually considering climate change and land use change. So climate change is definitely part of the explanation. And if you were to look at all the publications in the prairies, uh, you will see that snowmelt has always been taught to present 80 to 90 percent of the total runoff that we see in a given year in the prairies. Uh, there are new studies currently in the weather University of Saskatchewan, though, and what the new data are saying is that in recent years, the contribution of snowmelt to total runoff has decreased to 60, 70 percent, while um, rainfall events are becoming more and more important. And so we're going to have to take that aspect into account for future mitigation strategies, and we might even have to choose new prediction models accordingly. So that's for the climate change aspect. Um, the land use change is also critical, and to understand why, we just need to remember what makes up the flood. So we basically have a flood when it, we have the production of excess amounts of surface runoff and subsurface runoff. So basically, excess amounts of water both above and below ground. And usually, uh, surface runoff is much faster than subsurface runoff. And knowing that, we can basically compare pre-development conditions to post-development conditions. So pre-development, uh, when we have native prairie, when we had native prairie grass that was dominant for the landscape, and we still had a lot of wetlands, uh, the slow subsurface runoff was actually predominant rather than the fast surface runoff. And so that presumably led to less severe floods. Yes, the landscape was wet, but the floods were less severe. Post-development, though, because of the conversion of grassland into cropland and because of wetland drainage, we're actually in a situation now when we need to deal with the faster surface runoff component more, and so uh, more severe floods. And so I guess that's my way to say that some of the modern flooding events that we're seeing now are pretty much uh, human-caused disasters as much as they are uh, natural disasters, <laughs> simply because of the historical choices that were actually made uh, when developing the prairies. So, um, I think my last remark will be about the one in X year flood statistic, because you touched on it a little bit earlier as well. Uh, so I'm going to try and demystify it a little bit and explain the scientific rationale behind it as well. So I often do hear complaints about the fact that the one in 300 year flood now happens every two years, and usually those complaints are associated with verdict of blame against the poor flood forecasters. Um, except that the flood forecasters are really not to blame for this. And if anybody is to blame, there would probably be uh, researchers like me and stakeholders who are not doing a good enough job at explaining exactly what that statistic means. So when we refer to the one in 300 year flood, we do not actually mean that the flood will happen once every 300 years. We rather mean that every single year, there is a one in 300 chance that the flood will actually happen. So that's very different, because we're talking about a chance or an odd. It's a little bit like playing the lottery, except that the likelihood of a flood is actually much better than the big jackpot, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so that's really important to remember. And then we need to remember as well how that statistic is actually computed. And so when we refer to the one in X year flood, whatever X actually is, we need to consider the probability of a certain precipitation event happening and the probability of bank overtopping happening as well. 
So we just discussed change. The probability of a certain precipitation event happening is actually modified by climate change. And the probability of bank overtopping is modified by climate change and land use change. And so in other words, we compute the one in X year flood statistic based on historical data. But if the current climate and the current land use are different from historical ones, then that statistic becomes irrelevant. We we'll still use it up habits because it's convenient, but it's becoming more and more inadequate just because of the environmental change that we're either experiencing and or imposing on the landscape. And so it's very possible that what we're seeing now is actually the new normal, except that the one in X year flood cannot actually capture that dynamic. So I think I'll just stop here and leave it to discussions for the rest of the time.